The Uffizi. Before the pandemic, the number of visitors per year climbed to upwards of 4 million. People from around the world flocked to Florence to see masterpieces like Botticelli's Birth of Venus, Titian's Venus of Urbino, Artemisia Gentileschi's Judith and Holofernes, and Caravaggio's Medusa. As visitors come to the end of a kilometers long itinerary and make their way to the gift shop, they pass through a seemingly empty corridor. There is, however, an innocuous wooden door, behind which some of the collection's most fragile objects are housed, its prints and drawings. This part of the collection dates back to the 17th century and Cardinal Leopoldo de' Medici, the brother of Ferdinando II, Grand Duke of Tuscany. It was Leopoldo's enthusiasm for drawings that served as the nucleus for a collection that has since grown to include nearly 200,000 works on paper. Due to their light sensitivity and the fragility of paper, these objects rarely go on view, and for the most part can only be accessed via appointment. For my art history in 10, I want to take you with me into the study room and show you how I use the Uffizi's collections for my research. But before we head in, let me introduce myself. My name is Ariella Minden, and I'm a fifth year PhD candidate in the department. For the past three and a half years, I was a doctoral fellow at the Kunsthistorisches Institute in Florence. And just this March, I started a new fellowship in Dr. Sitzka Franzen's research group, Visualizing Science in Media Revolutions at the Bibliotheca Herziana. My dissertation looks at how printmaking was enthusiastically taken up in Bologna, a northern Italian university city between about 1500 and 1530. I use media theory as a lens through which to explore the European emergence of woodcuts, etchings, and engravings on paper, and consider how in their relative infancy they were being negotiated as forms of visual communication within an evolving media landscape. In doing so, I'm able to reflect upon how this corpus, made using new technologies, thematize and are loquacious on concepts of virtuosity, novelty, failure, expertise, objectivity, and innovation in order to offer a reassessment of a media revolution. Working on this topic has meant that I've had the pleasure of spending hours in rare book libraries and study rooms across Europe. For instance, here's me and my setup in Dresden. The boxes you see in the background contain the prints that I requested to look at during my time there. Today I'm planning my visit around the final chapter of my dissertation, which looks at Parmigianino's prints made predominantly during his three-year stay in Bologna between 1527, when he fled the sack of Rome, and 1530, at which point he returned to his hometown of Parma. Parmigianino was a prolific draftsman who used a wide range of drawing styles to work out different aspects of compositions for painted commissions, ranging from pen and ink line drawings used to figure out the mechanics of the human body, to red chalk drawings to establish figural relationships, to wash drawings made up almost entirely of tone and form rather than line. While in Rome, Gian Giacomo Caraglio made engravings after some of Parmigianino's designs, possibly for unrealized commissions, like this martyrdom of Saints Peter and Paul. However, it appears that the Parmese artist was quick to realize that engraving was not the medium for him, and instead he starts producing his own etchings, like this resurrection, and collaborating with Ugo de Carpi and Antonio de Trento to make chiaroscuro woodcuts like the truly magisterial Diogenes. My chapter explores how the artist was using these print technologies in an attempt to mechanically approximate the kind of expanded drawing practice that begins to really take off over the course of the 16th century. Today I want to make use of some of the roughly 80 drawings by Parmigianino housed in the Uffizi collection. The equipment that I always have on hand is a pencil, paper, ruler, magnifying glass, and flashlight. I get started by having a quick look at all of the objects in order to decide how to structure my time in the collection. I almost always look at each work individually, first writing down the basics such as the dimensions, material, and condition, and then move on to making general observations. I ask myself what the drawing was used for, if there's a surviving painting that relates to it, and if so, how does it relate? At what stage in the planning process might this have been made? Does the artist make changes directly on the sheet, or is there another drawing that's closer to the final product? What was Parmigianino trying to accomplish by working in a specific material or medium? Who was the intended audience of the drawing? Is it highly finished, or is it very sketchy? And the list goes on and on. After I do that for each drawing or print, then I move on to making comparisons. 
And what's so remarkable about the number of drawings that survived by Parmigianino is that not only do we have ample documentation of how Parmigianino conceived of paintings, but what he was interested in as part of his training as an artist. Important to me in this respect was his interest in prints, which I can talk about for ages, but today I'll focus on just one example in the Uffizi that's especially important for my research. So it's generally accepted that Ugo de Carpi and Parmigianino had some kind of working relationship certainly in Rome, and perhaps in Bologna as well. Around 1524, Parmigianino designs an altarpiece for Ugo to paint, depicting the Sudarium of St. Veronica, the cloth that Veronica offers to Christ on the road to the Calvary, where in wiping the sweat off his brow, Christ leaves an imprint of his face, which becomes an important contact relic said to be housed in St. Peter's Basilica, the destination of the altarpiece. While the painting is perhaps not the most impressive at face value, in it, Ugo makes a profound statement about the power of print by actually using a woodblock to impress the face of Christ onto the cloth, and signs the work by stating that it was made without the use of a brush, thus creating a powerful Christian genealogy of printmaking dating back to the time of Christ. If this printed painting isn't enough to convince you of the exceptional value that Ugo placed upon printed images, already in 1516 while still in Venice, which is where his career took off, Ugo appealed to the Senate for a privilege, what we would now call a patent, protecting his invention of printing in light and dark, what we would now call the chiaroscuro woodcut, which, just as an aside, he didn't actually invent. Upon leaving Venice, Ugo went to Rome, where he made these prints in light and dark after some works by Raphael, continuing to strongly assert his claim to the technique of using multiple tonal woodblocks to create an image, as we see here in this detail of a print remediating the fire in the Borgo in the Vatican Palace, which states the privilege he was granted both by the Venetian Senate and Pope Leo X. He also used this technique to make a print after the death of Ananias, one of Raphael's tapestries for the Sistine Chapel, which is where we get back to Parmigianino. It's clear that Parmigianino was interested in prints even before he started making them himself. Parmigianino looked closely at what other artists were doing and absorbed their techniques by way of both drawing and print. Ugo's woodcuts were no exception. Here in the Uffizi, there's a drawing where the artist has copied the central figural grouping in the death of Ananias, repositioning St. Peter to the left of St. Paul. Parmigianino scholars like to use this drawing to prove that Parmigianino was actually in the Sistine Chapel or that he had seen a preparatory drawing by Raphael, and that is where he was working from denying that he was working from a print. In arguing to the contrary, I first looked to Parmigianino's working methods, where he uses almost no line, but exclusively forms of different tonal gradations and wash to build up his figures in the drapery, which is similar to what Ugo was attempting to accomplish in the use of tone blocks to make his chiaroscuro woodcuts. But further evidence to support my argument could only be found by looking at these works side by side in person, because it becomes clear that the size of the figures is almost the same from print to drawing, further confirming that Parmigianino was very likely working with the printed version when he made his drawing. This kind of close looking and access to collections helps me to argue that Parmigianino did not see prints as merely a reproductive medium used to elevate his status or provide him with an additional source of income but as distinct media and technologies that complemented other experimentation central to his artistic practice. It is the seriality of prints that allows us to watch this kind of experimentation unfold. In this example of Saints Peter and John healing the lame man, another print after a Raphael tapestry for the Sistine Chapel, we can see how Parmigianino was trying to see how close he could come to approximating the hand by means of mechanical procedures. Here, Parmigianino, alongside Antonio da Trento, combined etching and chiaroscuro woodcut to create a remarkably similar look to something like this preparatory drawing for the St. Rock altarpiece made almost contemporaneously around 1527. This is a comparison that I was able to make when I was at the Pinacoteca Nazionale di Bologna. These three editions of the print show the radically different effects that could be achieved by altering the opacity, viscosity, and color scheme of the inks, as well as the addition and subtraction of tone blocks. The print in the middle is incredibly subtle, where the translucency of ink attempts to come as close as possible to printing an aqueous wash, and it is nearly impossible to see the blocks at all, whereas the one at the bottom of the photo, in using more opaque brown tones, leans heavily into the work's conceit as a printed image. 
the etching at the top doesn't actually have any wood blocks printed and might have been a proof of just the etched component of the composition. So I hope that in taking you along to the study room with me today, I've given you both an impression of my research and have encouraged you to seek out your local collections. While you do have to make an appointment, and sometimes you need a letter of introduction from a professor explaining why looking at these objects are important to your research or informative to your studies, all prints and drawing study rooms are free and most are open to the public. At U of T, you can have a look at 16th century prints in the rare book collections at the Fisher Library in Robarts and at the Center for Reformation and Renaissance Studies on the top floor of Pratt. Thanks for joining me and happy studies.